Okay, we are in a series, not a, fo- not a fan, but a follower, discipleship, but we're talking discipleship from kingdom of God perspective, and all of these words are probably, if you're first time, you're like, whoa, that's a lot of heavy biblical words. We will have a great time today, I promise you. So without further ado, just trust me, we're going to be like 20, 25 minutes, and we're done, but... Watch what God will do in your life today. So we're going to read a little bit of passage, and that is Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to start verse 11 and read all the way to chapter 2, and uh, all the way to chapter 2, verse 10, okay? So stay with me. It's an incredible explanation, depiction, and I won't, I mean, some of you are laughing, like, we're reading that much Bible. Yeah, because some of us barely read the Bible at home, so I feel like... I have to help you. No, I'm joking. We're just going to have fun. I have to read this to, to show you a big picture. And all I have today is one point. But, I'm, you know, just one point, one, one simple. It's like a train. Train has one um, uh, room. You know, that's the probably, uh, what are we going to call it? One uh, brain. Okay? And then all the other Cars are following it, yes? There's one brain, one thought. Everything else is following. Is that, does it make sense? Sometimes you have a, a, like 75 cars that are going different directions. You're like, where is the train going? One car, one brain, okay? And everything else is pulled with that car. Okay, so here we go. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. We're going to start. Please pretend you never read this before because I promise you, Some of us will feel like we've never read this before. (laughs) So let's have fun. In him, in God, in him. What if you were, whatever you're going through and you don't understand your life, you don't understand God, you don't understand what's going on around you. What if you ever opened Ephesians 2 and just read verse 11? This is how it starts. In him, in the beginning God, Genesis 1, 1. In him. Him, according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. Wow. So in God, according to his purpose, and all the things that he does because of the way he sees has to be done. I'm interpreting this. We, all of us here, we who first hoped in Christ have been destined, everybody say destined, have been destined, I love this word, destined. If you, and I've said it so many times, you will never, ever understand Christianity. If you can't, and I've said this, I've used this example many times, and so I am going to have, Freddie, come here, my friend. You don't have a choice now that I called your name. Sounders may play off. We were there last night. Come on, put your hands together. This is the the biggest legend in the history of Sounders, our dear friend and brother. So watch this. If you're ever confused in life, your life, things around you, you don't understand church, you don't understand like all things, you name it, sickness, death, whatever, injustice, we just read this and then we say, oh, in him, in God, he works all things according to his purpose to accomplish his purpose as he sees it wise. And then we who first hoped in Christ have been. So when God calls you, this is how it happens. He says, this is where I'm taking you. Not you, Dennis, don't raise your hand. Because <laughs> you're 21 and single. So no, I don't want to be like you. Marriage is good, amen? Is marriage good? Alexis, he, he's like a little bit. Is marriage good? He says very good. He's just quiet because his wife doesn't let me, does not let him talk loud. Okay, so he destined and appointed. He, so God says, hey, hey, right here. We are often confused about life. We don't understand God. We don't understand ourselves. We don't understand our marriages and kids and families and God, the kids you gave us, the wife, the husband you gave me. And he says, you're done talking? Yeah, okay. Well, here's the purpose I've called you to. So he's pointing destined. Remember the word, destined. 
So while you and I are struggling, and those struggles influence our life, the crazy purchases we make, the relocation that happens, the anger with our employer or employees or friends or neighbors, God says, chill, chill. This is where I'm taking you. Right, right there, right there. Thank you, Freddie. He destined, like this, remember it, he gets to your level. He hugs you, literally. He loves you so much. He hugs you. And he says, this is where you go. He destined and appointed to live. I don't even know why we're reading this much. I could just stay on this for like a long time. I mean, look how amazing the Bible is. Zoe, come join me. Come on. Like this is incredible life as Zoe is about to walk in in a minute. Okay. Life, true life. He says, for his glory in him, you also who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. The gospel of your salvation. Wow. And have believed in him. You heard it, you believe in him, were sealed with the promised. Whoo, Holy Spirit lives in you now. The promise that now he's in you, you're sealed by it, sealed by it. My seal is somewhere in a car because it's now too small, okay? Um, and so which is the guarantee? Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. To the praise of his glory for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love towards all saints, faith in Christ, love for all saints, another series, another time. I do not cease to give thanks, Paul says, personal note. I don't stop giving thanks for you, remembering you in all prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the prayer? God, what happened in Israel yesterday? God, what's happening in our country? God, what is happening with the economy? God, why was I let go, laid off? God, why don't, have, why don't have, I have enough money? God, why am I still single? God, why are my kids so weird? Or maybe, God, why can't I have more children or at least one? God, marriage that you have, I thought you gave me, why is it so hard? Or God... This place is tough. Or God, uh, the same old car. Or whatever you're praying for. Or God, I, I was praying for eyesight. I want a better vision. I, I still struggle. I still wear glasses. I don't know if I should do surgery, LASIK, no LASIK. People are saying different things. I kind of believe in your healing. I, I was claimed that you can heal me. All these prayers. <laughs> All this prayer. And Paul says, I am, when I heard about your faith, in him and your love for one another. I get on my knees and I start praying. He says, and I'm praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. How does spirit of wisdom come in revelation? Through knowing God. Whew. I don't know what this means, but I feel like it, you know? It's like, sometimes I don't, I don't, Wax it, I never wax, it's a joke. You know, just to kind of feel things, uh, uh, you know, mohawk in my, uh, but terrible joke. But all I'm trying to say is like, think about it. As you come to him, as you come to God, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, suddenly you are wiser and your eyes are open. You understand life, people around you, you understand your purpose. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Wow. In, in, I mean, so much to unpack. Let's just continue to read. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us? Power in us. Let me interpret this very quickly. The simplest way to interpret I mean, think about this immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe. What does that mean? The power of God in you to go through whatever is around you and what is happening to you. To go through it and trust God totally. Don't ever mistake it. The power has to do only great things, only miracle, only casting out demons. That's part of it. 
Don't ever think, by the way, that casting out demons is epitome of your spirituality or a miracle that you see. Wow, that's just a small part. Staying faithful at all times, that is the power of God. Being filled with faith at all times. Like, God, I trust you. You come home, you hear the news, whatever that is, I trust you. Everybody else is panicking. Irrational decision. Because you don't know where to lay your eyes to rest. Things are moving and feels like there's nothing immovable. And so because things are moving and you feel like, oh, oh my, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, oh my Lord. You make crazy decisions. What if you just say, Lord, you gave me the spirit, guarantee of my salvation. My inheritance is coming. I'm just going to trust you. So everybody else is running around because things are burning down. But I say, I trust you. Things are crazy, Lord, I trust you. That is, that is immeasurable greatness of his power as we believe according to the working of his great might, which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead, meaning if he raised Jesus from the dead when it felt like the whole world was falling apart. And for hours, the world was dark. <laughs> and everything was falling apart. And people betrayed Jesus. Guess what happens? Just a few days later, he raised him from the dead and he will do in you and I, accomplishing Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him sit at his right hand in the heavenly places. Whatever happens in the end, you win. You win in the end. Let's go, church. F far above all the rules and authority and power and dominion, like whatever happens, demons, devil, things happen. You don't understand. You watch TV. I mean, it's like crazy. And you're like, where's church? Church might be so weak. Where's my Christianity? I don't know. Relax. Talk to him. Relax, talk to him, relax, open his truth, his scripture. Just say, God, I trust you. I trust you. Don't ever, you might question people. You might even question certain churches, including every church. I don't care. Don't ever question God. He's in control right here, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his, Jesus' feet and has made him the head over all things. For who? For who? That's why when we gather here, we talk about who? Jesus. Does it make sense? Why we talk about Jesus? He's our head, he's our leader, the pioneer, the author, the finisher of our faith. Scripture calls it our older brother who went ahead of us. Jesus, things for the church, of all things for the church, which is his body, all of us. That's why we gather this morning. The fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus fills all in all. And sometimes it feels like it's so religious, just always talk about Jesus. It is, but it's powerful. It is. It's amazing. It's always about Jesus. And you, all of you, you and I, you, he made alive when you were dead through trespasses and sins. There you go. We were dead in trespasses and sins. That's why we're talking about salvation today. Part two, salvation part two. Trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You walked in the sin. You were a sinner and walked in sin. He says, following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience devil works in the lives of those that don't obey god it doesn't mean we judge them it doesn't mean we send them to hell we talked about it quite a bit but we acknowledge it we know it Verse 3, among these we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. In other words, we let our own carnal desires lead the way. Rule the way. Rule my life. Whatever feels good, I will pursue it. He says, following the desires of body and mind. And so we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. 
But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved, we were all dead in our sin. We lived like sinners. But God, who is rich in mercy, but God, we, this is who, the state of our life, but God, who is rich in mercy, he, he's the one that stepped into our life. Even when we were dead through our tr trespasses, he, God, made us alive together with Christ because of Jesus, we're alive. By grace, you have been saved. This was God's act. He stepped in. He's a pioneer. He says, he says, hey, Josh, I see where you're at, but I love you. Ben, I love you. Corbin, I love you. Elizabeth, I love you. Callie, I love you. God came into your life and says, I love you. And raised us up with Jesus and made us sit with him in heavenly places in Christ. He destined us already to be with Christ that is in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. This is the gift of God. Not because of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Greek word, just to surprise some of you. Anybody knows what's the Greek word for, it, for, for this? Poema. <sighs> poem. That's where we get the word poem. The beauty. It's beautiful. We are God's poem. This is in the Bible. Okay. He says, we are his poem, a poem created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord Jesus, I pray right now that for the next 15 minutes, we hear it and we allow your spirit to transform our mind as you renew our mind. In Jesus' name, amen. 15 minutes, give me 15 minutes. Here we go. God, 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 God created you and I for a purpose. God loves you. God loves me. God loves us. He created us to be royal priesthood, probably the best definition of who we are and where are we going. Royal, Jesus is the king. Royal, we belong to him. We are royal and we are priests. What does that mean? We reflect God to the world and we reflect the creation back to God. We talked about it last Sunday. If you were not here, please hear the message, the first part of it. So he made us his image, his image. We are his people. We are his people. That's who we are. Made us poema, beautiful, his workmanship for a purpose. Chapter 2, Genesis. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2, Genesis starts that God planted the Garden of Eden. He planted every tree, Scripture says. And then, can, you, can I have a, a, a Marina? I think it's, it's Marina today helping us. Verses 15 through 17. Genesis 2, 15 through 17. This I have to read to you, and that's it. I promise we will not read any, anything else, but this I have to show it to you. So Genesis 2, 15 through 17. I need to show this to you. It's very important. God planted Garden of Eden, and in the middle of that garden, he places two trees. One tree is the tree of what? Tree of? Say it loud. Everybody say tree of life. Very, very important to remember because sometimes we misunderstand scripture because of this simple principle, okay? The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Everybody say to work it. Now, the, the way to work it, we were talking this morning with Blaine as well, but most of you probably heard this before. I hope so. To work means to protect, to protect what God has created, to protect and also to serve. Everybody say to protect and to serve. Now, 
Before we go, I need to stop here for 30 seconds. In the end of chapter 1 Genesis, listen to me, everyone who's trying to get to heaven as soon as possible. In the final verses of, two final verses, uh, verses 30 and 31 in chapter 1 Genesis, when everything was created, seventh day is coming, God looked, everything was created, human, human, and he says, it is all very good. Remember this. Don't try to escape the world, meaning the earth, the creation of God. Why? Because you were meant to represent God to the creation. Don't try to curse what's around you because <clears throat> you were meant. <clears throat> I am so sorry. Almost, almost there on the other side of this cough for last, I don't know, two months or so. We were meant to say, God, look at your beauty. I will protect and I will serve your creation. So I'm not going to pray to escape to heaven. He says, everything is very good. And when God says it's very good, it is very good, church. The devil is at work. The devil is at work. But you and I know what God has called us to. Okay? So now, what happens? God places Adam and Eve to take care of it to protect it and serve it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free, oof. You are free to eat from any tree. You are free. What an amazing statement. God says, you are free. Anytime anyone ever questions your God, just says, God made me free. God does not want you to worship him because you have to but because you choose to. God does not want you to follow him because you're afraid of hell, but because you choose to. God does not want you to get excited about him, his promise. God doesn't want you to evangelize because you have to know, but because you want to. You are free. You are free. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Church, here is a statement. The reason God, as we know, and I'm not going to quote it because it's a known passage, the reason God kicked Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden is because they did trespass his law. They disobey God. They chose to follow their own agenda. They listened to the devil who spoke through serpent, which they were supposed to have dominion over creation. They listened. They let creation talk to them and appeal to their own, what? Desire. Their own desire. Hear me right now. It's basic but incredibly important for us to understand. And because they reached for it, Eve, Adam, God says, you have to be out. Why? Because you cannot live in sin and still eat from the tree of life. Let me say it one more time. And I'm sure a lot of us never understood this passage. Why would God kick them out of the Garden of Eden? Isn't God good? He is good. But in, in your sin, you cannot live eternally. Let me say it one more time. You will never live eternally if you live in sin. Because he placed tree of life, Adam could not live in sin and still eat and live eternally. Make sense? Very, very important, church. So what happens? Look at, look at Eve. Who did she blame? Serpent. Serpent doesn't have to blame anybody. He knows he's evil. He's done. He's screwed. So Eve blames serpent. Never anybody never apologizes or asks for repentance. I mean, asks for forgiveness. No. Eve says, this snake that you made, and Adam says, this wife that you have given me. <laughs> Look what happened in one instant moment. Why am I saying this? Because this is the moment that you and I have to realize that we are in the need of the Redeemer. 
This is the moment that you need to realize, and please stay with me. I want to be very brief today, but straight to the point. When we realize that it's not just that we failed, church, hear me, to protect what God is giving us, to protect the call of God upon your life. Salvation is never about escaping this earth and getting to heaven. No, God is giving you a purpose. The problem is that you cannot function in the purpose. Why? Because you failed. So it's failure of a functioning in a purpose. Why? Because as a person, now you are a sinner. So watch this. Sin corrupts the nature of humanity as well as corrupts the purpose of humanity. And it creeps into churches. It creeps into our lives. We don't understand what's the point of our life. We don't know what we should do. We're always confused about things we should do. Why? Because ourselves, we're all about ourselves. We're all about ourselves. Before I make this crazy statement about yesterday, I'm going to say this. Look what continues. Chapter 4 starts like what? Two sons. The older kills the youngest. Why? Jealousy. Selfishness. Chapter 5, evil continues. 6, let's make a name for ourselves. 7, everybody's against Noah. And it continues. The world they're living in, the corruption. Every type of sin you can imagine. I don't want to quote it. Here comes chapter 12. God comes into Abraham and he says, Abraham, leave the land of your father and your mother. And now God is giving him a covenant. God is having an agreement, covenant with humanity through one man, Abraham. And he says, watch this. He didn't even ask Abraham to say, this is your part to play. Okay, that comes later through Torah, through law. He doesn't. He just comes in. He's like, in you, I will bless all nations. This is God's promise. Later, when he is 99 and God shows up again, he's like, you're going to have a son. He couldn't physically, but he believed in God. And scripture says, that counted as his righteousness. But stay with Abraham for a moment. Isaac Look what happened to Jacob and his family. Sin, selfishness, sexual perversion, abuse of all type, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life, revenge, injustice. And this is, these are the children of Jacob who is renamed to Israel. They go to Egypt and literally some 150 years later, they are enslaved. Why? Because the corruption is through the roof. And God is showing them that you need redemption. So he sends Moses. Moses comes in, brings them out of Egypt in the middle of desert. God says, come, come to Sinai, come talk to me. And first he says, hey, hey, I'm going to give you a law. I will be your God. But listen, here's your part to play. Obey, obey the rules. Listen to my heart for your own sake. And then he says, don't miss this. He says, I'm going to give you an idea, an image of my presence in an ark of a covenant. Because creation is never about your creation. My creation is never about escaping to heaven. It's about God joining earth. It's about God wanting to be with you and I. So even in that corrupt world where they are complaining and rebelling against God, he says, let me give you the image of the Ark of the God. Why? It will represent that I am among you. God always wants to come here to be with us. Uh, three of you are like, should I say amen? I've never heard this before. What happens? They keep sinning. Look at Joshua. 
city by city. They're entering now in a promised land. Oh, the promised land, the land and the, and the family. Abraham, he promised the family. He promised them the land. But what? They are in the land and they are still rebelling against God. They have idols. So God says, okay. All right, well, he comes to David <laughs> and he says, David, David, David. David, a man after my heart, you keep seeking me when you were with, with sheep. Okay, I am going to work through you. And David is listening to God, making mistakes left and right, but he's following God. And in chapter 7, 2 Samuel, God comes to David just like Abraham. And he says, David, you always have a ruler in your genetic line. And by the way, oh, by the way, the ruler is coming through your genetic line. And in, 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 in chapter 7, he says to him, verse 14, I believe, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, he says, your son will be my son, and I will be his father. He's talking about Jesus. Genesis 3.15, right after sin, he's promising the Redeemer. Abraham, he's promising the Redeemer. He said, you don't have to sacrifice Isaac. I have already, Jehovah Jireh, I provided the redemption. That's where we get our name. And we quote Jehovah Jireh quickly for all of our needs. I need a bigger house, Lord. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I need a better car. I need Mercedes, Jehovah Jireh. And God says, well, I meant to say that Redeemer is coming. And I'm trying to redeem your brain, not just your old car. See what I'm saying? That's the truth. And so, so he came to David. He's like, your son will be mine. He's talking about Jesus. The Redeemer is coming. And David says, can I build you a temple? Can I build you a place? You can? And God says, no, 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 no. I've never asked for a piece of wood or, 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 you know, masonry type of work or a house. Can you build it for me? No. In fact, your hands are full of blood. I don't need you to build me. You are a man of war. Your son will build me a temple. But that's just a symbol of my presence. But even in a temple, they kept sinning. And what happened in the land God has given them, in a temple they built for God, they kept sinning and selling themselves and selling everything to other nations for their own comfort. So in 522, Babylonians come in and take Jews out of their land into captivity. Wow. From Garden of Eden, you kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and now you're kicked out of your own land. Sin. Sin. You can't live forever and live in sin. <laughs> but here's the good news. If I stop here, you'll be feeling like you're in the old churches where everything is wrong. The good news is God already knew that you will mess up. And the good news is he provided a redeemer already. <laughs> so they realize, and here's the key. They realize that we don't need anymore a family only. God, keep our family safe. They also realize, God, we don't need you to just keep our land sacred. In Isaiah 40, in the middle of captivity, he says, shout, scream out, shout out to Israel. Comfort, comfort, for God forgives your sin. Now the idea is, okay, it's no more us, the special ones, church, hear me right now. Please hear me right now. Because that's what we have in mind. It's me, myself and I, me and my family. God, keep me safe. Those neighbors of mine, oh, going to hell. My land, yep. America, the beautiful country. Isn't it funny this morning? Bills and, and, and Jaguars in London, <laughs> playing in London, and we are playing national anthem, which is full of, we beat you English people. 1776, you lost your battle. And we're playing in the capital of the United Kingdom. And they are watching our game that we stole the name from them. Anyway, that's just a funny thing altogether. But it's always about us. It's always about us and our land. And God says, no, the issue is in your heart. You are a sinner. You trespass my heart. Not even, don't think of it as just the law. It sounds terrible. It is the law. But the law sounds, if you don't understand grace, 
But the reality is God says, my heart for you is to live like this. My heart for you that if you do this and this and this, and this, you'll be blessed. Not because I said, okay, transactional activity. You did good, you're going to get paid for it. No, it's a law of sowing and reaping. I come to my wife, I said, beautiful girl, I love you. And I treat her nice, guess what? My night might be better than most of yours. No, but if I come in, I mean like, we're gonna go for a walk. That's what I always desire. Let's, let's all hold hands and go for a walk. My favorite part of marriage, you know? And so, especially in summertime, just sweat and realize that it's a curse of Adam, you know? And so, <clears throat> just like, oh, Adam. And, 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 and so then, 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 then what happens is, please hear me right now. It's a simple principle of sowing and reaping. Honor your father and your mother. You will live a long life. You won't die premature. I mean, pick any commandment. Pick any representation of God's heart. It's for your own good. That's all it is. But let's go back to it quickly and just explain salvation. And so what happens already in Old Testament, they say, God, we need your forgiveness. We need your forgiveness. So I challenge you today, I challenge you, realize that what God has called us to has been corrupt. And we need a redeemer to redeem our mindset and say, God, what you call me, it's not what I used to believe for. It's not what I used to do. It's not what I used to preach. We jeopardize our purpose. God-given purpose, God's call upon our lives to represent creation, to pray about everybody. That's our call. But why did it happen? Because our own lives are corrupt. Because we want what we want. Because we are the best. Because we are the strongest. We are the mightiest. How is that godly? So I'm not preaching here cute salvation. Raise your hand if you want to come to Jesus. We need salvation. We need to be redeemed. We need to be rescued from wrong thinking. We need to be rescued from misunderstanding God's design because you might believe wrong and you might be fighting a fight. It's a wrong battle, as I always say. You're not going to have it. Can I, can I say this to you? Salvation is personal. It's very personal. I went through Jesus' story, Jesus' conversation on salvation, all four gospels. Jesus is, as we know, red letters. It's very personal to Jesus. And he says, what do you need? You're struggling in your family? He says, I hear you. In fact, in Mark chapter seven, he says this, those that, are, that will persevere. Remember we pray in the beginning of the service when I came on stage, we said, God, I choose to trust you. He says, those that will persevere to the end will be saved. Hmm. Jesus' view, his view on salvation is very interesting. Yep, stay the course. Why? Trust him. The Redeemer was planned before you even sinned. That's Jesus. He also says the world is evil around you. He says, look, they come to him and says, oh, the tower of Siloam fell on people and they all died. What do you think about that? Where's justice? And also Herod took the blood of 70 plus rebels from Judea and mixed their blood with the blood of animals. And in Jewish world, it was like, Poof! they will cease to exist in eternity. Like, what do you think about it? Jesus says, do you think they were bigger sinners than you? He says, no, but if you don't repent, you will all die. That's his view of salvation, meaning you need a redeemer. Meaning I need a redeemer. Meaning, I don't, listen, I don't take an event and say, where is God? No. He says, just say, God, I need you. Everybody look at me. Your mom abused you. Your dad abused you. Maybe it was not there emotionally, financially, physically. Your brothers, your sisters, you were bullied in school. 
in your neighborhood, those that you thought were in authority to protect you, they betray you. Maybe your spouse betrayed you. Maybe you gave so much to your children and they turned their back on you. And you take an event and you say, God, where are you? And God says, I am the redeemer. I am the answer. But the answer is not about making the event better. The answer is changing your heart. The answer is changing their hearts. How am I going to do it? By you and I pray for them. And how is your prayer going to be effective? Just look at me for one last time. By saying, God, change my heart. Change my heart. Change my heart. In the narrative of the gospel, New Testament, it's called faith. Grace is God's part. Faith is my part. Grace is God says, when you did not know me, you didn't like me, you turned your back on me, you hated me, I stepped into your life and I said, I love you. In fact, he says, once again, I so love the world that I gave my one and only son for the world. Then he says, I didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world. Wow. And all I have to do is say, Jesus, I believe you. I see all the things around me, and I also see things in my life. But above everything, I see attitude of my heart can I confess to you something very 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 personal do you know how much I struggle I John Petrus struggle not with the growth of a church and not even with my marriage yet alone my family I struggle understanding how does God love me so much when I make so many mistakes and even more than that, when I have so many thoughts and ideas that are absolutely off? And that's what leads me back to my Redeemer. And I find myself at the feet of Jesus. This is as honest as I can be not trying to appeal to your emotions. But every time I wake up in the middle of the night and I do that all the time, my morning starts at about 3, 3.30. Middle of the night for me is like 1.30. I wake up and I think, what a grace of God. What? How gracious is our God, my God, to me. I get up and I'm thinking, Despite all my flaws, all my flaws, he loves me and he says, John, I am your redeemer. God never changed his mind about me. God will never change his mind about you. God never altered, fixed his purpose and say, oh, oh, all right, let, 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 let's make an adjustment. Never. I failed, he didn't. I make mistakes, he doesn't. I don't love him, he keeps loving me. Wow. This is the God that you and I serve. Church, church, 
my friends, my brothers, my sisters, can I appeal to you? Can I appeal to you all personally and tell you that the Redeemer is here to redeem your life, to redeem your heart, to redeem your mind, to give you a new mindset. So you are a changed, transformed, if I may, transformed person. Redeemer is here and he says, I love you. you this morning would you just tell him just tell him say God I need you I need you let's stand to our feet